sure we're uh, coming through. <clears throat> Hopefully we're being heard. I hear me clicking. Chris, uh, say something. Make sure you're coming through okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, I'll turn this sound off. Okay. So, uh, yep, they're saying uh, we're heard. So. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming back. It's uh, been a while since Chris and I spoke last. Let me put that down. Uh, what I'm going to do is go through a, a kind of a recap of where we left off. And then uh, <clears throat> I want to go through a few slides that, are, that I put together just to keep me on track, keep my mind uh, on focus with what, what I want to talk about. And, um, and, and some of that has to do with some of the comments that I've been looking at uh, in the, well, since it was uh, October 21st is when we met last. So I'll go through that. And then I'm going to go through my homework. Um, we, we both ended our last hangout with homework to do. And uh, Chris can talk about his. I, he had homework. I had homework. I'll go through mine. Um, I think Chris needs a little more time to do his, but he, he can speak to that. And then I have questions. I want to end it with uh, some questions about GPS, which hopefully will launch into our next Hangout. We're going to really try to keep this to one hour. Uh, I've got an alarm set on my phone at 10 minutes till so that uh, we can kind of see where we are and, and, and try to wrap it up so we don't just go on for hours and hours. So with that, I will go ahead and start the recap. Okay, that's what I'm going to begin with. And um, th like I said, we met on October the 21st. The first hangout on the list, uh, wh what I threw out there was how does the eight inches times the mile squared formula work? If you go back to this hangout and look at the uh, uh, description box, there's a, there's a pretty good list of topics related to surveying. And as I've made it very clear, my interest is surveying. And when I find people who profess that the earth is flat and they are involved in surveying, I'm curious about that. And that, that's really why I'm even having this type of conversation. Now, during that hangout, Chris brought up this particular book, which I downloaded uh, later after the hangout. This kind of, you, you could tell I was like thrown for a, a loop a little bit. I was unaware of this book. It's a great book. I'm glad that I have it now. But during the Hangout, Chris was showing these pages, talking about that book. And uh, it, as it turns out, and I found out later, that, that this is actually out of uh, Samuel Robotham's book. So we, we, we never did get to talk about the eight inches times the miles squared. And uh, maybe we will or maybe we won't. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, but we'll see. So like I said, we ended with... Uh, homework. I proposed to Chris that he would uh, do a certain test, and I'm hoping that he does end up doing that. Um, I I did my homework, and I and I will show what I came up with uh, during this hangout, and I'll have questions for Chris. So uh, I propose that Chris go and do what I call an L-shaped test. That is just just some survey lines in the shape of an L. And uh, subsequent to our hangout on the 21st, I made a video detailing uh, that so that if anyone's interested or curious, like, what do I mean by an L-shaped test? It looks like this. And in that video, I, in this video, you can go and look at it. I describe uh, just making a shape of an L. It could actually be this way if you want. But just trying to go north, south, east, west. And I describe the observations to be made on that test. So, uh, yeah. So, Chris, um, you, I, you know, we traded some emails. You, you've been very busy, and man, you're like you're you're working past uh, sun sunset and all that. And I understand that. Um, so, you didn't get to do the test. Are you going to be able to get around to it later? 
I don't know. I can't make promises. I or I'm not going to make promises. I can't keep because it's just going to get darker earlier and earlier. Right. I hear that. Well, that's the other thing is if you can't do this, this will take about three hours to do. I generally do these things on Saturdays. If you can't do the full blown thing, you might just do one line. And in fact, if you ever have some survey work that you're doing, that would even suffice. Like you don't have to go out and specially do this arrangement. You, you, you could come up with the same set of data and the same set of measurements that we could look at on any traverse that you might be doing, any any survey. So and we, we could talk about that. So I'm just saying, if you don't have the time to do a full blown, you can certainly do a partial and, and it will still give you the same information that we need to uh, talk about. And uh, of course, I, I'm showing this screen. This looks like your same data collector. Do you have one of these? Chris? Yes. Okay. So in there, there's some instrument adjustments uh, that you would run through prior to the test. It takes about 10 minutes to do it. And uh, I'm, I'm showing this because I, I'm thinking that possibly this information here might uh, come into play with what you've been um, describing as uh, instrumental uh, what, what would you call it? Instrumental errors or flaws or uh, built-in problem? What, what do you, how do you term it? It's been uh, called uh, interior refraction or parallax. Okay. And uh, do you still think that that is applicable to the modern equipment we're using today? Because I could, you know, as I researched this, uh, I looked at it, I, I could see that there were some issues with some instruments back in those days, but do um, you still see it as uh, uh, relevant to the work you're doing today? No, not to the work I'm doing because I don't push my uh, transit past its calibrated limits. And I believe the S10, the S6, they're all meant to do uh, observations about 3,900 to 4,000 feet. If you start pushing it past that, then yes, you're going to start experiencing the interior refraction or the. Uh, yeah. I beg you to differ, differ with you. What I think you're mixing up two things, Chris. You're talking about the length limit on the EDM. Uh, however, the angular ability of the instrument to measure uh, triangulation angles is uh, can go much farther than that, but. Uh, we can, we can get into that. So anyway, you'd want to do these prior to that to this test. Uh, certainly, you'd want to do these prior to any uh, you know crucial work that you're doing. This is how these built-in adjustments are what uh, keep this instrument performing optimally at its uh, specified um, capabilities. So I threw this in here to kind of get me to talk a little bit about some of the comments that are are being. Uh, well, the comments on my channel, I, mean, I guess this happens all over the place, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going to talk to the audience right now, Chris, and you know, maybe you can tell me what you think of this too. I, I get some real like hateful kinds of commentary. And if anybody knows uh, Flat Earth Math, you know, do you know that guy? His name's Charles. Yes. He always ends his, uh, do you know him, who I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. He always ends his hangouts or his videos with some words of kindness and just telling people, look, let's, <laughs> you know, let's keep it friendly. I, I like his, his approach. Um, and I wonder when people get so hateful in their comments, like, what is it about really? I mean, is it that you now know the earth is flat and, and, and I'm someone who doesn't believe that. So you should, you know, comment the way you do. And I'm not even going to say the stuff that gets said. It's just, it's, what do you think? I mean, isn't it awful? Yeah, I delete yeah. those comments. Yeah, and it is on both sides. Let's face it, I'm not trying to, this isn't, I, I've always said this, it's on both sides. I find that people that, who are, uh, you know, against flat earthers, they uh, they will treat them, 
the same way. So let's let's knock that stuff off. And uh, you know, your your comments won't last on my channel. I agree with you, Chris. I just delete them. I mean, what are you thinking? Do you think you're going to come here and reach me? I mean, if the Earth is flat and you think it's that important, um, wouldn't you want to uh, try harder to uh, give me some evidence of it instead of calling names or, you know. Uh, you know, the accusations and all this, it's, it's, you know, like, uh, you, you won't believe how many times I'm called a Mason, you know, what lodge am I in? It's like, okay, it just, it just goes to show you that the kind of mindset that's there. I'm not a Mason. I, I, I'm not in a lodge. <laughs> and I, I always answer, I'm in the lodge in your mind, you're imagining these things. It's just, uh, it's pretty pointless. So, um, and the other thing is, I think, okay, there was a time when this person didn't think the earth was flat. Okay. How were they treated? <laughs> and now they've come to recognize the earth is flat and this is how you're going to treat other people who haven't uh, also uh, come to your same belief system. Um, I guess this kind of dynamic can uh, go, goes, uh, can go in a lot of directions. So anyway, I want to just throw this out there. Let's keep it kind. You know, wh why not? <laughs> you know, I don't think the earth is flat. So, that, that makes me a fraud. <laughs> I'm a surveyor, you know, I haven't seen that the earth is flat. So now here I wanted to, I threw this in here to talk about our backgrounds, Chris. People were really questioning that. Of course, you have a fan base here that is coming on, really questioning my ability to be, to, to, uh, to function as a surveyor, perform a, a practice surveying. And, you know, they're all supportive of you. And uh, likewise, there are people praising me as a surveyor and, you know, criticizing you. But I figured let's take a chance here to just speak about our own backgrounds, let people hear what it is we do uh, day to day, uh, you, know, uh, you know. So uh, how about if you start or I'll start, whichever, but I was going to ask you, you know, when did you start surveying? I started in 1983 with uh, Missouri and Highway and Transportation Department. Okay. And back then, what, what kinds of surveying were you working on? On uh, the highways, reconstruction of highways and bridges. Okay. Using electronic total station equipment or back no, then no, transits? No. or uh, uh, They had the old 100-foot chain, plumb bob with a 20 or 30 second gun with the non-adjustable legs. Right, okay, a transit, like a Paragon, k &E Paragon or yeah, something like that. All right, so we're pretty similar. I, I think we had this conversation a while back, maybe a year or so ago, you and I had a hangout. So uh, I'm, I started in 1978, so not, you know, not very long before you. So we, we pretty much have been in this, uh, um, for a similar amount of time. Uh, and so what kind of work are you doing presently, like where you work now? Uh, we do, uh, we've done quite a few multi-million dollar condominiums on zero setbacks. We do lots of tower surveys. Like, at, you mean like a cell tower? Yeah. Okay. Rooftops, uh, new cell tower sites, oil wells, uh, just about anything out as mortgage surveys. Okay. So, yeah, so boundary topos and uh, and specialty things like cell tower surveys and that, you know, sounds similar to me. So um, I do pretty much the same thing. I also do high order control for LIDAR. If people don't know what LIDAR is, it's, it's basically laser scanning uh, from a mobile platform, whether it's a vehicle with the with the uh, laser scanners mounted on the vehicle driving down the highways or mounted on a unmanned uh, aerial vehicle UAV uh, these applications require targeting on the ground and people you know you may have seen these things they look like uh, white X's painted in the streets along the roads or along the edges of the roads those are survey targets for aerial could be aerial photogrammetry uh, or or these um, scanning type applications lidar so i do that type of control work and those are you know done to very exacting uh, tolerances 
and uh, lots of control in tunnels like uh, uh, you know subways and things like that. So, uh, what else? Do you want to throw anything else in there, Chris, about surveying our backgrounds, or if you have any questions for me? No, I'm just I've had twelve and a half years of uh, civil engineering too. Oh, okay, so you do design work, what, like a civil design, or what is it? No, that's when I worked for the Highway and Transportation Department. I did five years of surveying and then got promoted up to engineering level, and they put me on bridge rehabilitation, new bridges. But when okay. they put us on when they put us on those projects, they'd have two of us on there. So we did all the surveying for the project and everything else. Okay. And then what year was it that you uh, came upon the flat earth? Let's ask you that. Cause I, you know, that's probably relevant to this. You have a long career in surveying and engineering. What, uh, when did you come upon flat earth and start looking into it? In 2014. And it didn't take too long for me to figure out the deception. Okay. So about four years ago. Yeah. Combined with, I also have my pilot's license. Yeah, I think you brought that up the last time we talked, uh, not the last hangout, but in the previous uh, ha couple hangouts we had. And, uh, you know, I have no experience as a pilot. I I would uh, refer to Wolfie 6020. He's a professional airline pilot. But, um, okay, so let's keep going here. <clears throat> I think uh, – oh, and I, I also, people, uh, there's no way I can monitor the chat and do and do this. So – I appreciate all the questions that are being asked or comments being made. Hopefully they're kind. <laughs> Keep it friendly, people. But um, I'll look back at them later, and uh, they can become, you know, the impetus for f further conversation if, if we are to continue doing this. So uh, I th I'm, I'm going to talk about this real quick. I... Uh, I want to emphasize that I am coming to this as a surveyor and with no, I, I, you know, I have no patents on any of this. This is not my creation. I refer to standards and specifications that are published. Uh, and so I made a video of that and that's what it's called surveying standards and specifications, uh, you know, to, uh, to that guide a mapping and construction. And you can go look at that video and uh, it lists out not all, it's a partial listing, but it's a good broad, uh, you know, broad uh, spectrum of what, what's involved here with surveying, where the standards are, how this equipment works, how we are to operate this equipment and so forth. So I wanted people to at least have a chance to, you know, have access to that and realize that's, that's my, uh, if it's a contribution, it's just I'm representing what surveyors do. That's that's it. That's all I'm bringing to this, and um, so I'm sharing that. And um, I'd like to keep it to that because uh, you know, to me, that's what we're talking about. And if if there's flaws, if there's a deception, you ought to be able to find it in these books. Just find the right page find out where the deception is uh, and, uh, you know, point it out. Like, see this right here? It doesn't work that way. And have something to back it up. I think we we need to back it up. And uh, to me, again, I'm, I'm looking at these and I'm looking at our ability to do the measuring. So that's why I've asked Chris to do that test because I've done it many, many times. The L-shaped test, I've have, I have many <laughs> occurrences of doing that. And I'd love for... Uh, Chris to do it himself and then let's look at his measurements and compare his to mine and I think we're going to find out they're the same. So uh, Chris, do you know, are you familiar with this um, this document? No. All right, these are the current standards. They were published in 98, uh, 1998. It's, um, this is kind of the new way of describing the accuracy of survey surveys that you're, you're well familiar with, you know, when they used to talk first order, second order and third order, you know, it would be one part in a hundred thousand or one part in 50,000, you know, the precision ratio, you're familiar with those, right? Yes. 
Okay, so that's what we that's what we surveyed by. Those are historic. They are still useful and still are used in in certain applications, but these have been published because it was recognized that some surveys nowadays are not even being done with a total station or theatolite type of an instrument, yet they are deriving positions of points. And so if you take a look at this document, it is not prescriptive. It doesn't say, you know, thou shalt measure it eight times and then measure the distance this many times and do this many repetitions. All of that's gone. And all they're doing is giving you accuracy bands and accuracy classification. So you would select the uh, select you would select the accuracy for the project that you're doing or someone's going to tell you you know we need these targets located to be within x amount of centimeters horizontally x amount of millimeters vertically let's just say and from that you would then select the equipment that you're going to use and the methodology that's required to achieve those results so yeah take a look at that chris go back and it's linked in my uh it's it's linked in in this uh, video in the in the uh, pinned comment. It was too long to put in the description, so you'll find it down in the uh, pinned comment. And the types of surveys I get called in on are, are, you know, they're in this, they're down in in this range here. If you're doing a boundaries and topo, you know, you might be in this range. Now Chris talked about doing zero zero lot line development you're talking when you're in the city you're down in these thresholds right i mean you got to keep it <laughs> it's too easy to to cross the line right when you're doing those yeah. condominiums in those tall buildings so there's a lot that goes into trying to obtain these types of uh accuracies at a 95 percent confidence all right so if you're interested in all these statistics there's a link in that um, in that video that I did on standards and specifications. Um, do you know this book, Chris? Yes. Okay, so you, do you have this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to throw in some books to, for people and to... Black Laws also. Which one? The Black Laws book for the... Oh, yeah, Black's, Black's Law Dictionary. So I wanted to throw a few books up here that are common textbooks that surveyors use to refer to to basically learn how to do what we do. And um, so this is one of them, Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles. Um, do you have this book, Chris? Oh, the new uh, 2010. This yeah. one's nine. Yeah. I, this is the one I could find a PDF of, but uh, yeah, so. The one that took, play, or took the place of the 1973 manual. Yes, yes. Okay. so. This was a book that Chris would be using for certainly for breaking down sections and so forth. It's the manual of instructions. And, uh, you know, it's going to tell you basically what principles guide the uh, decision making. And uh, there's another book I didn't put it in here, but Lost and Obliterated Corners, how those are reestablished, etc. People should, uh, you know, be aware of that. And th this is linked in, in that video that I talked about. Um, here's an old one. This one goes back to 1902, and you can get them going back as far as into the 1800s. And here's a, a good, good old standard. Do you have this one? No. Okay. I think uh, we got it at our office, though. Yeah. We got a pretty good library at our office of survey books. Yeah, you can't, you know, I you're from having to purchase them. Yeah, I hear you. And, you know, they, they can be expensive. Uh, I try to find some of this stuff as PDFs. Some of them are, but th these tend not to be. But um, when you're going for your license, you do collect a library and you, you try to learn these books backward and forward. You put tabs on them. And, uh, you know, because there's no way you can memorize everything, you, you, you learn the principles, the basics, and then there are things you just have to look up occasionally because there's, it's, you know, you know the basic principle, but you may need to look up a coefficient or some other uh, uh, number, you know, in, in whether you're talking about leveling or traverse triangulation or what have you. 
So you, you need these. And here's another standard. Either one of these are, are good. Did, have you ever heard of this one or do you have this at work in the yeah, library? Yeah. Yeah. Moffat and Bouchard. Do you, have, do you have this one? Which is that one? This is Ben Buckner's uh, Astronomic and Grid Azimuths, you know, no. doing solar. Have you ever done any solar observations no. for, for azimuth? Um, I, I love doing these. I, back in the 80s, I used to do these all the time. And if, uh, if, if Larry Scott is in the chat, <laughs> he's, uh, he's got me super interested back into doing these. And I just did one a couple weeks ago. Uh, since we've had GPS, you know, uh, we pretty much, I've, I've been quoted saying, we use it for everything. And, you know, it's true. Chris used GPS a lot, right? Yeah. So, but I would say for your own interest, uh, for your own just kind of basic background to what's going on with this, if you learn how to do one of these with an older theatolite, I think you would enjoy it. It's, uh, you know, you're actually looking at the sun moving, you know, what's moving, the earth or the sun, okay? But the, the, what you're seeing in your telescope is the, the sun moving across the crosshair. And, you know, you're going to have a stopwatch in your hand. You start that stopwatch at the top of the hour of UTC, and you can get that from a radio broadcast on shortwave radio. Or now I'm just using an app on my phone to get precise time. You start the stopwatch. And then you record your angles to the sun, uh, you know, several times. So you do several repetitions of this to uh, actually measure angles to the sun. And you use the trailing edge. So when the sun crosses your crosshair, right as it's tangent, you stop that stopwatch and you record that time. And then you, you do the calculations and you're using um, spherical trigonometry to calculate the azimuth from the sun back to some line or here's your point on earth and you're going to be able to calculate the azimuth on that line very precisely so i used to do these all the time and like i said when you know by the time gps became so widespread and so easy to use there's really uh it's not necessary anymore but uh you might want to check it out chris if you can ever fit it in Oh, I've read into them. And yeah, I mean, I've, like to, to, yeah. to actually do it, record your own measurements, and then do the calculations, you know, to see how it all works. I mean, I think some light bulbs might go off for you. Um, I doubt that very seriously. I, well, the, the fact is, is that you would be doing this. Then the, I mean, maybe you're not curious about it, but the curiosity to me is if the earth, if the sun is close and overhead as flat earth, I mean, do, I guess there's different variations of this. Do you believe the Earth, the sun is like 3,000 miles up circling overhead or something? I don't believe it's 93 million miles. Well, but, but, but is, is, is it how, how far away it is? But I do believe, I do believe that it is uh, way closer than 93 million miles. Okay. Well, let's do that just... with your eyes. If you go out and watch sunrises, and you watch shadows, it is very apparent that it's not 93 million miles away at, as we have been fed our entire life. Okay. Well, let's, you know, uh, putting aside how far away it is, just think about the mechanics of the sun traveling overhead. And, it, and you could make the same measurements that I'm making or any other surveyor that may has been ma making these measurements for hundreds of years. Um, how do you compute an azimuth on a line on the Earth? Um, how do you do it? You still there? Yeah, I'm still. Oh. Okay, so if if you know, is there such a thing as a flat Earth ephemeris? Because I use an ephemeris. The ephemeris tells me where the sun is going to be at that time, at that moment in time. I, I actually compute the position of the sun uh, using spherical trigonometry, and it, and it works. I don't know how to do that on flat Earth. So that's why I thought Did that might that pique your interest. PDF that I sent you? Pardon me? Did you read that PDF that I sent you? 
The PDF that I sent you explains to you exactly how that works on a flat earth. Which PDF are you talking about? Because I may have missed it. You probably did. It was the one that I sent you after the Heather book. I don't. Th I, the next thing I got from you was the two pages from the Robotham book. Then it would have been after that one. I didn't get that. <laughs> so maybe you could, you know, just resend it to me. But uh, anyway, if it's possible to uh, do that, I'd be interested to see. Would you know? Maybe that's something you would. It, it interests me a lot. I don't know if uh, if it does you, but if it's possible to compute that azimuth by observ observing the sun and using some type of flat earth coordinate system to determine that azimuth, I'd, I'd like to see that. Well, don't you break down everything you do to a fundamental plane? No. That? No, not for this. Not at all. This is purely uh, spherical trigonometry. And like I said, it's the ephemeris is a prediction of where the sun is going to be on a date. And, you know, well, yeah, that's because the sky above you is the most perfect clock that you could ever have. Yeah, but uh, like I said, it's spherical trig. It's declination and, uh, you know, the Greenwich hour angle. So, again, you know, if there's a flat earth ephemeris, you know, let's, let's have a look at it. I'd like to see how you would take those same observations and compute that azimuth. It's one thing to talk about this stuff, and it's one thing to pull up PDFs of things. It's another thing to actually do the measurements. You know, I think the measurements win. So, well, do you have this book? No. This is also Ben Buckner, uh, one of the most professional surveyors I've ever met, uh, and I, he's he's since passed, but he's a he's a, a really good man, and he. Uh, you know, he wrote, he really wrote some great books and this is another one. Um, you know, this is a book you need to work through to, uh, to understand the precision of your measurements and how to actually compute the results uh, from the observations that we make. Now, um, now I'll move away from books. Are you aware of this program, the CST program? No. I'm bringing this up uh, for you and also for anybody, you know, watching this. Let's talk about the fact that, you know, there's different career paths people take. Some people really want to become a licensed surveyor and they do everything they can to go through, take, you know, first of all, apply to be accepted to take the test. You have to document your your work history and show the board that you are competent and ready to take the test. Different states have different requirements. Some of them require you to actually file a plat, you know, bring a plat that you've prepared to show that you've, you're, you're ready now to take the examination to then become a licensed surveyor. Some people collect a lot of licenses. <laughs> I know people that have 14 licenses. I never got that interested to do that, but I'm licensed in only one state, New Jersey. But what I'm going to talk about now are all those people who don't care for that. Maybe they just want to work in the field all their lives. They want to, or, or they're not interested maybe in, in going in that direction to become licensed surveyors. But the uh, National Society of Professional Surveyors put together this program to, to create some type of a credential that you can take these tests and become a level one or a level two and it's good to show in your resume, hey, I've attained this body of knowledge. I'm competent at this level. And uh, so you you apply and you take this exam and you can become a certified survey technician. So something you might be interested in looking into. By now in your career, you could probably get up to level four. By now, Jesse, I could be licensed if I want to. Yeah, but just the I'm, reason to hang on. There's a reason why I didn't get licensed, and you mentioned that. If I if I got my license, I would be sitting in an office all day long, and there is absolutely no way I'm going to go into an office and sit in front of a computer for eight or ten hours a day. Not only that, I've well, worked with licensed surveyors 
that are extremely knowledgeable. And I've also worked with licensed surveyors that couldn't pour piss out of a boot. So the license and the 30 years I've been doing this, the license doesn't mean that you know everything about surveying or you have a great knowledge in surveying. All that license means is that you have the right to stamp and file plats and you're under the legal ob obligations of the state that you work under. And yeah. I have truly come across more surveyors that have been licensed that I question how they ever got their license. Yeah, I've met people like that too, Chris. So, that And that's in everything. In engineering, when I was in engineering, it was the same way. You get young kids that come out of school that you thought they had 30 years of experience. Then you had some engineers that had been in that business for 25 years, and basically all they had was t one year of experience 25 times over. Yeah. And that, I agree with you. You'll find that in every field and in every endeavor. But I wouldn't let something like that make the decision for me on what I would do. And I beg to differ. If you're saying you would become a licensed surveyor and then you have to sit in the office, that's, un that's not true at all. I do not sit in the office and I'm out doing practicing surveying. So the other thing is that um, there's, there are lots of surveyors who are licensed who stay in the field and do their own work. So that one, that one isn't necessarily true. Uh, maybe it is where you, maybe. Work, I don't know. But maybe in your thing is that, that where I'm at, Jesse, that's exactly what happens. Okay. So you chose not to do that and that's fine. I mean, I'm not, and I'm sure if I did get licensed, there's people out there right now that would do the same thing to me that they did to Brian Mullen. So I'm actually glad that I'm not licensed because you have these backhanded, backstabbing people that would go around trying to call the board and get my license removed because they think I'm not a competent surveyor uh, due to my beliefs. Yeah, well, you know, beliefs are one thing, measurements and, and evidence are, are an entirely different thing. And that's why we're having these conversations. That's why I'm wanting to talk to you. Uh, and I had hoped you would have had the time to do your test, but maybe it'll happen later and that's okay. Now, by the way, I, I'm bringing this up. I wasn't, I want to make sure you know, and everyone listening, I'm not like pointing at you going, Hey, why aren't you licensed? I'm not, but I did. I asked you, had you heard of this? You hadn't this. All I'm saying is for anybody listening who may be in the field of surveying, who doesn't know about this, check it out. It's another way to just say, hey, I, I have this many years in, I do understand what I'm doing, and I've passed this exam, and it's, 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 it's a good way to just say, hey, I have this credential. And, uh, you know, the job market can be tough, and if one guy has a CST and, a, and maybe an, another guy doesn't, they, they may look at the guy with the level three certified uh, survey technician uh, credential and, uh, you know, select him. So it's just... That's all I'm. That's all I'm pointing out here. Um, and and here's you, you can actually download uh, PDFs of sample exams, and this is just a picture of the level one. The um, levels one, two, and three are exams. Level four, you uh, put forward. A proposal or they I think they actually tell you they give you a research project to do and you literally go and research the that topic could be photogrammetry laser scanning who knows it could be any topic that you go and do a re you research that write a paper on that and and that gets you a level four you have to have level three to go for four so Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk about is because in the comments, and again, Chris, this is you and me talking, but also this is for the benefit of others who were making comments about accuracy, precision, how, how do these instruments work and all this sort of thing. Did You're aware of this uh, calibration baseline program? Yes, I am. Okay. And while we're on that, I've had this conversation with many surveyors that I work for. 
because back in the day when you had a 20 and 30 second gun, whenever you were doing boundaries or altas or accurate surveys, you always turn two or three angles to a building corner or to a control point because your instrument could only read to 20 or 30 seconds. Nowadays, we have instruments that read to one second, correct? Yes. Okay. So my contention is, is that if you, if your gun will not turn angles and it is not properly serviced, then you need to get it in to get serviced. Turning six angles to the same point is ridiculous redundancy. If your instrument is not properly serviced and properly calibrated, then it needs to be taken in and get calibrated or you need to calibrate it. Hmm. Well, you know, we don't turn those repetitions only because of the least count reading of the instrument. There's other reasons. Like if you're following a specification that says you got to turn four sets, it's not just because whether or not the instrument is a one second instrument or if it's calibrated or not. I mean, the, the assumption is when you turn in your calibration certificate with the survey report that you, you know, <laughs> it's like, what's the, what's the word here? You know, you're not, uh, the assumption is you are, are certainly calibrating your equipment as part of this project. So that's not why we turn repetitions. Yeah, I call it adding error. Yeah, find that in the survey textbook. You know, this is interesting that you, you, you've been practicing long enough that you have, I mean, maybe you could write your own surveying book. And I'm not trying to be facetious about this. It's simply that you're calling into question these things. You're pulling up old Robotham books, and that's how you're approaching this. Whereas, you know, these things exist, and all surveyors practice by them. Are you? But you're like taking issue with these practices. So I don't, I don't know where that leads you. You know. Um, anyway, for anyone, for anybody who's interested, if you have not done this, I would, I would encourage you to do it. You're going to find out if your instrument is actually measuring to the national standard of one foot or one meter. So you could pick your state, okay? And you can then find these calibration baselines that have been measured uh, more than once, usually twice or more, to come up with these published lengths that you can compare your instrument to. And uh, on the topic of what you just raised about sending your instrument in for service, uh, just the way you were speaking about surveyors, you know, that are unlicensed but are great. And then these other guys that are licensed and, would you say, couldn't pour piss from a what? Couldn't pour piss out of a boot. Okay, that's good. The, you will find the same thing can be true of these uh, instrument service providers that service instruments. I've gotten instruments back from different service providers that said that they've calibrated the instrument. I bring it out to the calibration baseline and it can't measure to within a several centimeters of one of these lines. So I would never just accept that if I get, when I get my instruments back from service, I go check them personally because I'm responsible for what they're doing. So we might have a difference of opinion on that, but it's more important to me that you go out here and you learn how to, to do this process. And uh, there's a book about it, tells you how to use a calibration baseline. And uh, oh, had one at the state. Huh? We had one at the state where we could take out our equipment. Yeah, it's, for the, thing. it's for the EDM. It's not for, for the angles. It's for measuring your distances. Um, yeah, so it's just another thing that surveyors do. So now I'm going to go into what my homework was. Um, my homework was to, because, uh, you know, if you, if anyone listened to our first hangout or you do go back and listen to it, you'll hear me say repeatedly, I'm, I'm not aware of this. And I wasn't aware of that book 
but uh, but I did download it and um, it's, it, you still there, Chris? Yeah. Okay, I heard some noise that I didn't know if you were still there. So here you you had set up your instruments level with each other, and this is an auto level, and this is your Topcon total station instrument. And um, while wow, we are coming up on 15 minutes, I better start moving. You had, if I understood you, you were replicating the Robotham test. Is that what you were uh, attempting to do? Yes. Okay. And in the Robotham test, he was looking through a, a blank cylinder, just a tube uh, next to a theodolite or a, or a level. I'm not sure which instrument it was. In this case, you were not looking through a tube. You were comparing your level to this is your theodolite no it well you're uh, off a little bit there basically this what he said was is that he got different surveyors with different instruments to all set up their instruments at the same time and due to the difference in how those transits or levels whatever they chose to set up had a different dip below the crosshair due to the difference in the either the quality or how many lenses were used. Right, right, right. A colonization of the transit or the level itself. Okay. But if you if you took a calibrated tube with a crosshair in the center of it and you leveled it up, you would see the crosshair met the horizon which proves that there is refraction and different refractions within the instruments. Now, I do believe back in the day they discovered this, so I'm sure over the past 50 years, they have all the instruments pretty much made uh, pretty close to the same specifications so that each one of them is equal in their dip. But if you take a level and you compare it to a transit, you're going to see that due to the optics and the difference in magnification, you're going to have a dip below the crosshair that is different. And if you don't, you're not supposed to use a level to shoot two miles. Of course not. And that is what I'm trying to get across here is back in the day, when they were out doing all these triangulation points, they were sitting on a mountaintop and sighting another mountaintop 50 miles away, which would in fact bring in this refraction error within the instruments because they are pushing those transits and instruments way past what they were ever intended to be used for. All right, let me help you there. The, uh, what you, you just mixed up two things. The triangulation was not done with levels. It was done with transits, transits and theodolites. And they pushed and up transits and theodolites way past their capability. No, 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 no. Not they, at all. They were, listen, I, okay, you've stated your case, and you can believe that. And I'm here to tell you you're not correct. They were measuring horizontal angles with that. And, and, and those were done at night. And then... Uh, they would measure zenith angles in the afternoons. And uh, so back, back to your test here. I just want to explore this a little bit more here. Uh, this is the theodolite. That is the level. And uh, now you had two instruments out here. And uh, you're, you're right to point out that they are actually looking at, you, you set this at 90. And, uh, and this, of course, there's nothing to set. It's supposed to be perpendicular to the direction of, of gravity here. So they're both looking at uh, different spots. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were to set up another level, it might be looking somewhere else. And uh, I had asked you when we met the last time if you had plunged the scope in the reverse direction with your theodolite, and you had said no. And you need to do that because when you do, you're going to find that that scope, it might be down here or it might be up here. And uh, all, all this test did was show that these two instruments 
are looking at two different things. And we, do you still say they were about a foot, a foot and a half apart? It really doesn't matter how far apart they are. What you say? I'm I'm trying to show you is, is that due to magnification, when you look through the different instruments with different magnifications, you're going to have different drops from the crosshair to what you're looking at. Yeah. So back in the day, before theodolites, you know, this is what maps looked like. You know, they were almost like cartoons, but it was the best they could do. It was dead reckoning. I mean, that's supposed to be Florida, you know? So this was uh, their best attempt at mapping the land, you know? And uh, here's another one here. Of course, they hadn't even been into the interior yet. This is North America. Again, it's all based on navigating with ships and trying to determine their latitude with a sextant. And this is the best they could come up with way early on. Uh, here's another one. You know, it looks nothing like what uh, what we know to be the case today. Um, so back before theodolites and telescopes and, and all that, they used very crude methodology to measure and do triangulation using trigonometry to measure the distance across a river or the height of uh, buildings or, or what have you. And, uh, you know, there's, this is just a piece of string here. It's, it's not a telescope. And these are old crude tools used to measure. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I don't Have you heard of the plane table? Some yeah. people listening may not have. So, this was some old examples of the plane table. And uh, you would set that up, cite what it was, and literally draw the line. And you were actually producing the map in the field on this table. And there's no telescope involved at all. But what is involved here is perspective. I mean, that's, that's a direct application of perspective. And it's done horizontally and vertically. So. You can Google uh, plane table surveying and you'll get all, you can either look at the images and you'll see what these things look like. Um, it's an alidade here and you are literally drawing the lines and creating the map. And you literally set it up around this area where you were doing the surveying and you, you created the map right in the field. Okay. No telescopes involved. Now, later when triangulation began uh, in the uh, late, in the, well, it started in the 1600s, but it really took off in the 1700s. And it's really during the 1800s that incredible work was done. Here's the transcontinental arc of uh, triangulation from uh, Cape May, New Jersey, following the 39th parallel all the way across. This is a, this is a very interesting book worth uh, taking a look at the uh, transcontinental triangulation and the American arc of the parallel. They did another one from up in Canada along the 98th parallel down all the way down into Mexico. And what we're talking about is uh, these tall towers getting up away from refraction. I mean, they're still going to have refraction, but it's nowhere near what it is down here in the ground. And they would observe not with a level, but with a theodolite, and measure numerous repetitions on two different nights. Um, and this is how we end up with uh, the control that's used to make all the maps we use today. Of course, you know, now, uh, would, would do you have any, uh, Chris, what do you think of the shape of things today in terms of uh, the maps and, and uh, well, here's a zoom, I'll zoom in here. You know, here's Colorado where you are. These are the arcs of triangulation uh, that, that go through these states, all measured by these guys doing that. And, uh, you know, here's some really long lines, mountaintop to mountaintop. And you're, you claim they, they sighted too far. So are, if you think they sighted too far, do you question or do you not, think that these are where they map them to be? Well, they were close, but like I said, the last time we hung out, they have been finding 
absolute mistakes in a lot of the work that they did back then. So did they try their best? Yeah, they tried their best. And each one of them had different equipment out there. They no, had not in this case. Capabilities of accuracy. And Chris, Chris not, that's, you're actually saying things that are incorrect. These were all done very methodically using very strict, stringent methodology. And I've linked you to the books that will tell you exactly how this was done. Okay. Now, when you say they found mistakes, I think you're talking about the comment you had made when I put this video up. Question for Flat Earth Believers, Boundaries and Land Features. You had made a comment in here about the about this mark being uh, not in the right place. And I think you're really bringing up something else, which is uh, boundary disputes, uh, interpretation of where a mark no jesse you can look that up on the ngs website that point is set in error and they admit to it okay uh, i so, it's over 1800 feet in the wrong place yeah and i read about it chris and it isn't what we're t it has nothing to do with the adelaide error it has everything to do with an interpretation of where it was supposed to be however we know exactly where that mark is, whether or not it is at the corner of these states where it's purported to be. But we do know its exact position. Okay, you're mixing up two different things, and if you let, if that's how you're thinking about this, Chris. Uh, again, I'll come back to this. All this triangulation. Do you accept the maps? And I think I have another map here. I, I go on to, you know, people can look at this. You can pause here, folks, later and read this. You can't have it both ways. If the surveying equipment and methodology is all flawed, then that means all the maps that we have, the mountain elevations, it's all wrong. You know, the sea coasts, the coastlines, the everything. It can't be correct. It's, it's one way or the other. It can't, you can't have it both ways. So... And I say that it's dead on. Uh, I didn't hear what you said. Just go ahead and say that. I said that it's fairly close. I'll give them they tried their best and they tried to do it as, as accurate as possible. But yeah, they made mistakes and that's not exactly right. And the maps aren't perfect. But can we find our way from point A to point B? Yeah, we can still find our way from point A to point B, which well, proves what? Well, let's. I th well, let's let's discuss this. This is a this is a topographic well, map. Done here, we got like three minutes. Yeah, we do. So, all right. Let's just wrap it up this way. We we got three minutes. If you want to cut it right at that at uh, ten, we can. If you want to go a little bit past, it's it's up to you, Chris. Yeah, uh, I can run so you're, you're, on before we're done. You're, you're a surveyor. You're working under a surveyor. You didn't want to be licensed. So it, the work that you're doing, is it accurate? Yes. So is mine. Mine is too. So mine wasn't accurate. We'd be paying for lots of buildings to be tore down and put okay. in the wrong place. So you're doing accurate work and I'm doing accurate work. Uh, the th Are you are you willing to do the test I asked you to do? Or if you can't take the time to do the full test, are you willing to come up with some place where you could have a north-south line or an east-west line to come up with those types of measurements? That and, we and again, I think I asked this last time, what are these measurements going to prove? Well, that the Earth what is the intent of yeah. these measurements. Well, it's going to show that you can make the same measurements that I do, and that once you have that set of measurements, you would have the ability or the opportunity to explain to me and everyone listening how that actually indicates that the Earth is flat, not curved. That's what it's for. And I'd also encourage you to go ahead and GPS those points additionally. You don't have to, 
we can just look at the angles themselves, but I think it would add add uh, something for our next conversation on state plane coordinates and GPS if you take the chance take the opportunity to uh, oh that's what I wanted to ask you next is GPS I do have questions for you on GPS I don't think this will go another five minutes are you uh, up for that sure so I I looked on my phone I wondered like if I was to walk all the way to you, how long would it take? 24 days, it says here, just using Google Maps. Do you use Google Maps? Yeah. So you punch in an address, tells you how to get there. You know? Yeah, you mean on your mobile device? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know that strictly works off the of triangulation of towers for sure. Yeah, yeah, wait, wait. I just no, no. When we talk about when we get to, I'm just asking a couple questions because I want to know okay. what you what you use it for, and you know, I know you have your theories about how it works, but we can. I think we should delve into that very deeply. Okay, but we're I I don't, I don't have time to launch into it all the way. But have you ever looked at the GPS that they're using on board farming equipment? Yeah, and they also use it on heavy equipment too. You like this? Yes. Do you think it'd be worth showing? This is a three minute, oh, oh wait, a one minute video. How about if I just show that for everyone watching? If, if we could just do that, this is that one. And I, I don't know if I can get people to hear this. Let me try this. One second. I noticed you didn't kick up yourself on video this time either. So can you kick on your video? We'd like to see you. I just tried to get the sound for people to hear it. I don't know if they can or not, but uh, could could you hear the sound? No. Okay. Oh, well, I don't know how to do it so that you can hear it, but you get the idea. These GPS receivers are on the dozer blade, actually literally guiding the blade up and down. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I do want to talk with you about GPS in depth. But right now, I just wanted to find out if, if you think it works. Does it work? Of course it works. Okay, so it works. You just have a different idea on how it's working. And so at least we can establish that you use it. Um, you, you repeat your own self, right? You go out one day and GPS a point. You hit it again. You're within an acceptable tolerance the next time you check it. Are you happy with that? As long as I don't use VRS, if I set up a base, I check in. VR is the biggest junk I've ever used in all my life. It's untrustable. Okay. Now, what's Chris, for everyone listening, Chris is talking about what's called VRS, Virtual Reference System. It is a internet-based correction service. And in some areas of the country, it, it works really well. In others, it really depends on who's operating the network. Uh, and uh, so it's really, for folks listening, it's just an augmented way of using GPS to to be more convenient and where i live it works really really well all up and down the east coast now so you do you guys set up your own base unit and broadcast radio corrections is that how you do your rtk yeah whenever we yeah we used to use vrs but we're going now and setting up a base okay. and i'm not the only one that has that opinion of vrs everybody yeah. in my office has found out that it's the worst it's untrustable. Well, again, at what uh, what system are you hooking to there in Colorado? I know there's a few. It's uh, one through uh, Tremble, I believe, here. It's a paid. He pays a subscription for it each yeah. month. Okay. And, you know, it could be user error too, Chris. I mean, I'm not going to say that you're, you're – I'm not going to – without seeing the data, I would have to check it, you know, because – my experience using using VRS, Trimble VRS, is exceedingly good, and it's repeatable day after day after day. So, okay, well, yeah, I've seen it. people. <clears throat> what? What'd you say? I said uh, user error. Explain user error. 
Uh, it could be your settings. It could be uh, how you're mounting to the mount point. It could be a number of things that we'd have to be looked at. Uh, and you, dial, you dial into the mount point, and from that point forward, you're working off of the so-called Coors system. So where would instrument or where would operator error be? As I said, uh, you could, I don't, I don't know what, when you say it isn't so working me, well, everybody, let me, let me ask you a question, Chris. With, Chris. Everybody that I work with that are really good surveyors that have done this for a long time have the same opinion I do. Okay. Um, the question yeah. is, is when you say it's not working well, and I don't, I mean, I'm not here to argue the, that everyone should use VRS. I'm, you know, I've heard you, I've heard surveyors say what you're saying. Okay. So it's not news to me. And I've also found surveyors not using it correctly. I don't know what you're doing. And maybe, maybe if you want to talk about it further, cause we're going to go into another hour here. I think that it's on the list of topics. I think it's definitely related to state plane coordinates when we get to that one. And, uh, but look, we do a lot of work where we do not use VRS. We use base and Rover like you guys. So there's times where that's how it has to be. You're going to put up your own base station over a control point and, uh, and your rover is going to get corrections from your base, not some internet base. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's all good. But anyway, in general, uh, not. You know, I asked you, does GPS work? And you you launched into VRS. You don't like VRS? Fine. Use base and rover. But what you're saying is GPS works, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. I, that's all I really wanted to get to uh, on on that. And let's see. I'll go back to my slides. I think I'm. I think that was probably the last thing I wanted to ask you. Oh, and I was encouraging you that if you if you do that test to hit those points. And, and if you do base and rover, man, I'd put my base here and and nail that guy and then nail that guy. So you'd have vectors. You know, you store vectors, right? You don't just store positions. You know what I'm yeah, talking about? We do something like that. I usually use RTK infill. Yeah, but I'm what I mean is uh the resultant the results of your RTK, do you store it as a position or a vector? A position. Yeah. In this case, you want the vector because you want the DX, DY, DZ uh, components, not just the point. You don't, you know, if you're going to do this test, you want to be able to compare your GPS to your EDM. That's um, why I run it in RTK infill and then you have your RINAX file. Yeah, well, of course, yeah, absolutely. Store the raw data, and we'll do some post-processing on that. Uh, I, The paper I wrote a long time ago on this topic of grid to ground, I encourage people to go and take their RTK kit out onto the EDM baseline that I talked about earlier, the EDM baseline. Put your GPS on that line, and you'll find out that you're measuring the same lengths as the EDM. Uh, but anyway, yeah do that and uh, but or or not it's up to you I mean really we're after the zenith angle measurements uh, and uh, adding the GPS is just going to give you an extra bonus to do some other conversation about what's going on in between those points and this is the test I did the L test if you uh, I hope you get around to doing your own if you can't then we could use some of mine and uh, I'll be glad to share that data with you and uh, hear your explanation of what's going on. In, in this case, this test, I, uh, I did it a little differently. This is in a golf course and this happens to be at 40 North, 75 West. And uh, somebody actually put a piece of granite there <laughs> on that green and it says North 40, 75 West. And what I did is I put the RTK here and laid out five arc seconds over here and five arc seconds here in latitude and longitude and did the L test with, with that uh, as, as part of it for the analysis. But we can talk about that when, uh, when we get to that. And that's it. And we didn't do too badly. It's nine after. So...
I have a question from a friend of mine that lives out in Australia. He wanted me to ask you this question. His name's Glenn. And his question is, is, you know, the pictures that Sam Lee took of uh, the causeway? Yeah. Do you believe those are accurate pictures? He took them from my hotel room. I was in the room when he set up his equipment, Chris, and I kid you not, when I walked over, I mean, this is when I walked over and looked down what I saw, I busted out laughing so hard. We have it on video. I just couldn't believe what I was. I just couldn't believe that that looked like that. It was amazing. And if you understand photography, you'll understand why it looks that way. Uh, oh, so, so the answer to the question is, yeah. I mean, I certainly do believe it. I saw it with my own eyes. By the way, Sally just uh, popped a Hangout message to me. He's going to do an after show of this Hangout, and he asked me to invite you over if you want to come over to that. I would not be on a Hangout with Sam, Sam Lee if you put a gun to my head. Okay. Uh, I, well, I will. Here's I'm, my here's my closing. And I don't. Well, you know what? If you're going to talk like that, I don't know if uh, if I want you. I don't think I want to hear it. You know, it's like, why? You know, no, you, you know, you, listen to me, Chris. I'm going to tell you something. I'm in, in all honesty. Oh, Soundly's like here. Yeah, really? Why? Why don't you say why you feel such vitriol for Soundly? What the heck? He's, he's a good man. That's a good man right there. Okay. Well, that's your opinion. And I've seen his deceitful pictures. I've actually done photo forensics on a few of his pictures. So I know exactly how soundly is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, That's based what? upon based upon your in a, inability to absolutely operate surveying equipment correctly, uh, I, I really doubt you have any ability to do any f photographic forensics. So, you know what? I, I've been into this with you. Uh, treat you fairly and honestly. Uh, and you know what? You can say all you want. And you can dig up these old books of yours that talk about the incorrect telescopes and all this crap. But guess what? You make the same measurements I do. And until you put it up and make these measurements, right, and explain how those measurements prove the Earth is flat, you're just talking, all right? And with that... Well, the burden you, of proof is on you, Jesse, not on me. <laughs> Dude. And... You know what? No, the, the, you're the one coming out saying that the instruments are flawed. You're the one saying that the maps are incorrect. You're the one saying that. So the burden of proof, the burden of proof is on you. So what? No, it's not. Okay. Here, here's, here's my closing, Jesse, and I was going to be nice about it. And I'm still going to be nice about it. You are 100% convinced that you go out on a daily basis and measure curvature of the earth. Is that correct? Actually, no. What are you measuring? How do you, why do you believe the earth is curved? Through your measurements? The, the, I could take your measurements. I can take, I don't, you don't have to use my measurements. I'll use I'm your not, measurements. I'm just No, you, like, you, Chris, Chris, you, are measuring the same thing that I measure. But produce your measurements and I'll show you exactly what you're measuring and that the earth is curved with your measurements. So you're the one that needs to do that. I've done it. I've done it a lot. And uh, it's up to you to show the flaw, to show the, uh, the you, if you think it's deceit, okay, show where the deception is uh, or it's a flaw in some way, yet you do this day in and day out. I don't understand how your employer, you know, what's he think? If, if, are you doing any special correction to your equipment or your, your measurements? No. Because it, it, let me ask, I asked you this before in the, uh, in the last time. Do you measure 500 feet on a Traverse? Yes, I do. With and your you one with majority of the time, Jesse, let me have five minutes here to talk. Uh, you've had you, we've talked back and forth throughout this whole thing. No, but I'm not going to I'm not going to you're not going to get a 5 minute end where you get to trash soundly or or anything like that. That's not going to happen. Hey, Jeff. Right? 
I'm and, not going to trash soundly. Here's but, what I'm going to say, short and sweet. You believe what you believe. There is absolutely no way that you're ever going to get me to believe that we live on a globe. I've seen too much. Your simpleton measurements don't explain why we can see things extremely further than we should. So you need to stop looking at the micro and start looking at the big picture. Well, okay. The big picture so what's what's the long and again and again and again that uh, you can see things way further away than you're supposed to. What's an example? Try and convince me of this. What's an example? It's not gonna work. What's an example of a, you know, the longest triangulation line measured is just under 200 miles. It's not over 200 miles. It's under 200 miles in California. So, why, you know, so why? basically, I'm going to end this with Jesse. There's no need for us to talk any further because you're not going to convince me of your point of view. No, so you're not, what you're saying is you're, a you're, no. of evidence that proves that we do not live on a spinning ball hurtling through outer space. Yeah. And no matter how many measurements that you're going to try and get me to measure is not going to convince Okay. You. Okay. All it's right. So that's an easy cop out. You so aren't, you that, aren't going to make the measurements. You're not going to do it. You've already decided that even if you made the measurements, that uh, it would not show you that the earth is curved and exactly. you can do it. You Chris, you could do it in a mile. You could do it in five miles or you could do it in a thousand feet. 10 miles. And that don't explain why you can see mountaintops over 275 feet away, Jesse. That doesn't explain how you can see the Chicago skyline 60 miles away. Yeah, that's fine. You can do that. You can go up there onto that. There's, an, there's a geodetic station up there called Bald Tom 2. You can go all the way around. Have you I'm seen the, to the mic? Chris, Chris, it's down to this, man. If you're not going to make the measurements to talk about those measurements, all you're doing is talking. And if that's how it's going to be, we, we can end this. We don't have to continue this. I was giving you the opportunity to you show to show to me. Jesse, to I'm show tried to put out is you think that I don't understand surveying. No, I it's not no true. I, that is not true. It is, Jesse. No, it's I not. Have no clue of what's going on. That's so not true. Or you're trying to teach me the points that I'm missing. The no. points that I don't understand. Nope, nope, so nope, nope. And surveying, and I don't understand the measurements that I take each and every day. That is not true, Chris. Yes, it I, is. I, it is. I have not said that on this hangout or ever. It's I'm saying. I'm way. saying. I said to you that you are fully capable of making the same measurements that I make, and if you would try that one simple test, even one line, just one line, so that we could talk about it. That's all I've asked you to do. And I'm and not like here. I said you're you're set in your ways. You believe what you. No, no. Believe. It's not that I'm you set in my ways. I'm saying that that no. shows difference. So there is a. It's Chris, absolute Chris, waste you've shown of me. my time and a waste of your time. Yeah, Chris. And that's all I have well, left to say. Well, just to be clear, I mean, I'm going to go over. If we're done here, I'm going to go and over to uh, Soundly's uh, after show, and you're welcome to join over there. But I will say this, Chris. What you the way you just ended your your closing remarks are are not accurate. I have not done that. I've asked you to do one simple measurement that we could talk about together. I've done those measurements. I wanted you to do them. That's all. And if you could show me how those point to the earth being flat, that's what I was interested to hear from you, Chris. That's all. And the rest of it isn't true what you just said. I think Chris might be gone. You still there? All right. I guess he left. All right. I'm going over to Soundly's channel now. Uh, let's see what's going on on mine. That was ridiculous. Chris has a bunch of fans in here. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I want to tell you all before I go over to Soundly's.
I have something to say to you. Uh, uh, how do I want to tell you this? Look, Chris. Chris has been measuring a long time. He's he's been working as a surveyor for a long time, and the test that he did showing his level and his telescope is a perfect example to clue you in that he does not know how to operate those instruments. Okay, and but you as his fans, his flat Earth core. You don't know the difference. You don't know the difference. So, oh, it's Southern Israelite. You know, uh, Southern Israelite, I'll tell you something. I don't know who you are, but earlier today, Chris sent me a link to a video of yours. Um, I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have a chance to watch it yet, but uh, we'll take that up another time. So anyway, the chat's flying by and everybody's saying, hey, why aren't, why aren't you... Uh, answering you know how can I possibly answer you right now so we're in no rush we could take this as we go and uh, take our time with it but uh, you folks who are f flat earth believers and you think Chris is uh, a surveyor who you know he's on your side you're on his side but you you don't know you don't have the ability to make that call you don't have the ability to discern the difference and that's why I asked Chris to do one simple thing and he didn't do it and I, th I believed him he said he just didn't have time now I find out at the end of this hangout he's not gonna do it it would be pointless to do it and that uh, he'll never be convinced well his his mind is made up and you know you can talk all you want it's, it's in the measurements, okay? And he's making measurements every single day that if he were to take the time to look at them, he would see that the earth is curved. But he's not going to do that. So this becomes a beliefs thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the what you want to believe. And, uh, you know, I can't help him. But, uh, well, I, I, I guess we're not going to do this again. And uh, that's just the way it is. But, uh, you know, I guess I'll just end it here. There's nothing else to say. Chris left, and uh, and uh, I guess I'll end it somewhere, somehow. And I'm going to go over to Soundly's channel. If you all want to come over there, have a good night, everybody.